where it all comes tumbling down. Where is that? It wasn't very good. This wishes it was a Cersei. It's understandable. I don't know me. I don't know what I'm going to like. So in July, I read, I think, 19 books and DNF'd one, or I read 20 books and I DNF'd one. I don't know, but this stack has already fallen once, and I don't fancy having it fall again. So, um, I don't know, we'll count them as, I will not count them. Just, it's some, it's like 19-ish. Okay, okay. Let's do this before it all comes tumbling down. First book I read in July. Please don't fall. If I let go, will you fall? First book that I read in July was The Stardust Thief by Chelsea Abdullah. And this book, I did not really like. Like at all. It was one of the most mediocre and boring books. Like I legitimately forgot that I read this until I looked at my TBR stack and I was like, oh yeah, I read that. It wasn't very good. It's just extremely amateurish and dull and long and silly. And just like every dumb thing that annoys that piss out of me in books is all in this book. I believe it's a debut. I'm not sure about that. It certainly feels like a debut. If it's not, it really has no excuse for being this amateurish. I really wanted to like it. I really would like to find some Middle Eastern inspired fantasy that I like. This is not it though. It's definitely not it. I've seen a lot of people liking it. So, you know, don't listen to me. A lot of people like it. But if you're super picky like me, then you probably don't read it. The first three books were a big disappointment. So just trying to get through those. The next book I read was When the Sky Fell on Splendor by Emily Henry. I picked this up quite a while ago, or I mean, I, I acquired it quite a while ago because um, it was like right after I read Beach Read and that was my very first Emily Henry book and I loved Beach Read. So I was like, I must have this author's backlist. So this in particular called out to me at the time because this was compared to Stranger Things and I love Stranger Things. I was gonna say I'm wearing my Stranger Things shirt but I wore that for a different video that I filmed today. Anyway, yes, I love Stranger Things. I really loved Beach Read so I was like, an author who I like writing a thing that's reminiscent of another thing that I like. That sounds great. This was another two star book because it was, the execution was I was a little more invested and intrigued than I was by Stardust Thief. Like the characters grabbed me a little bit more, not a lot more. And the story itself, at first I was like, um, this is like pretty uh, cliche slash stupid, but like, we'll see where it goes. Maybe that has a decent enough explanation or a decent enough conclusion, but no, like the, the resolution to this, the reveal for like what has been going on, the Stranger Things-esque thing, you know, the supernatural. It's also kind of like Super 8, the movie, um, or just like a lot of stuff like that. I mean, uh, Stranger Things is itself like reminiscent of many other things. So, you know, there's like a small town, paranormal things going on, you get the vibe. And like the paranormal thing that's going on, it's um, like at first, you know, it's like an intriguing mystery, right? You know, you're like, well, I want to know what's happening. But when you find out what's happening, it's not just like, oh, it's disappointing now that you know, it's quite stupid. Like extremely stupid. Um, like I was like probably, I was thinking about like probably like a three stars for most of it. I was like, I don't hate this, but you know, it's not great. And then when I got to the end and found out what had been happening, I was like, oh no. Oh no. Unfortunately, this was a big, 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 big miss for me. But you know, I continue to read Emily Henry books. I've got her new book, Book Lovers, um, on my, on deck to be read at some point soon. Next up is another book that constantly gets lumped in with an author that I love. <laughs> And that is The Silence of the Girls by Pat Barker. The author that I love with whom this gets lumped is obviously, or perhaps not obviously, but I think pretty obviously Madeline Miller. I really haven't liked anybody else's stuff that's like Madeline Miller, so, or that's considered to be like Madeline Miller. Anyway, this is a retelling of not the whole of, but part of the Iliad, but from the perspective of the female characters. Um, yeah. It's, um, People call it feminist. I don't think it's very feminist. People call it, you know, what do they say? I don't know. The I feel like the people, when I saw people talking about it, you know, it was like, oh, it's like Madeline Miller and it's like a, a great twist on this like classic mythic story and so brilliant to see it from the perspective of the females that aren't usually centered in these stories. And like, that's what Cersei is. <laughs> and Cersei is great. This wishes it was Cersei. Like all of the attempts at like feminist conversation, they're so like surface level and obvious slash also not quite in keeping with the world, with a Greek like understanding of the world. Like it feels extremely like, I mean, I don't know. We've seen a lot of like sort of like Western Christianized versions of Greek myths. Uh, I remember in particular watching the Book of Virtues TV show when I was a kid on PBS. 
And it was like, you know, a bunch of different fables for kids, like uh, life lessons and things like that. And it would show stories from the Bible and it would show stories from Greek mythology and it would show Aesop's fables and things like that. They were quite a Western Christianized version when they were talking about Greek and Roman myth. And then like, you know, Disney's Hercules is again a quite, you know, Western Christianized version of Greek kind of stories and Greek gods. I mean, the fact that like Hercules' parents are in a monogamous relationship, you're like, that's absolutely not true. <laughs> this wasn't like Disney's Hercules, but I don't know. It just felt like it didn't really have anything interesting to say. Like, I, I don't know how else to say it. Like just, if you take a story and you tell it from the perspective of a female uh, instead, you know, like take an existing story, an existing myth, an existing play, an existing whatever. And the only thing you've done is to tell it from the perspective of a female. But there's like nothing, no reason to have done that. You know, like there's no, there's no like interesting twist to what's going on by doing that. There's no like interesting new perspective that that creates. It's more just like, huh, yeah, we do always focus on the men, huh? But like, that's, that's it. Like, that's really all that there wasn't, I didn't get anything out of this. There wasn't anything, any food for thought, you know, it was just like, yeah, okay. We focus on the women who are like, we are the ones that suffer and the men are the ones that get the glory. Yeah. Never heard that before. So I, I just like, you know, like Dark Descent of Elizabeth Frankenstein tells the story of Frankenstein from the perspective of Elizabeth Lavenza. And that is one of the best books I've ever read in my life because not only does it fully understand Frankenstein and pay a great respect to the original source material, it also has something interesting to say when we tell it from the perspective of Elizabeth instead, a character that is practically not a character in the original story. Telling it from her perspective is a project. It's not just like, what if we told it from the girl's perspective? Like, no, like it completely recontextualizes the entire story of Frankenstein and it is brilliant. So well done. Circe by Madeline Miller, which is, you know, more akin to this because it's Greek Roman type stuff. Uh, existing mythic figures, the character of Circe and telling it from her perspective. Well done, brilliantly done, very thought provoking, very beautifully written. This had nothing to say beyond exactly what you would expect without ever having read it. The next book I read um, was a surprise delight and that was The Queen of the Tearling by Erica Johansson. I have the entire Queen of the Tearling trilogy and everyone tells me that it gets shitty. Like the last, I don't know if the second book is bad, but that for sure the conclusion of the trilogy is quite bad. It was very disappointing because I really, really enjoyed The Queen of the Tearling. I'd heard a lot of great things about Queen of the Tearling, which is why I had gone ahead and just purchased all three books when they were coming out. Because I was pretty confident that I would like it. And having read just the first one, if I hadn't talked to anybody, I'd be like, this is gonna be a great trilogy, like fantastic. So I'm very upset to, to hear that if I continue with this series, I will guaranteed be disappointed because I really, really enjoyed Queen of the Tearling. I was, I found, I don't think this is YA. I think it was one of those books that was like lumped in with YA all the time because it's got queen in the title and it's by a female author and therefore it's YA. And the protagonist is like pretty young, uh, not like a child, you know, not, uh, but she's like a youngish protagonist. I mean, it says uh, an untested young princess must claim her throne. So like people are like, oh, that's YA. But I believe this is not YA. Yeah, it's, it's published by Harper, not Harper Teen. So it is adult. But anyway, like there are so many books that have like queen or princess in the title and it's some young queen, young princess who's coming into her own. And like those stories are a dime a dozen. But this book had some fairly unique world building and some legitimately good like political situation navigating. Like I've again read books like that where like this young queen is thrust into the situation where there's like a tough political situation, but it's like not very well thought out and pretty straightforward. And like the challenge the queen must face is like, I must do something for the people, but like sacrifice the romance that I want to have. Oh no. Like, you know, it's some bullshit like that. This is legitimately a kind of, a kind of gray situation uh, with like a lot of different competing interests that would be difficult to navigate. Uh, in addition to just sort of like secrets that have been kept from her that she's trying to figure out. There is some magic. It's, I believe, a post-apocalyptic world. So I'm not exactly sure how magic fits into that, but I was like very curious to find out. I'm I'm guessing maybe that's what makes the ending stupid is like some reveal to do with that. Because I, I mean, this beginning is so promising that I'm like already trying to like prepare myself for like, okay, so how's it going to fuck it up? Like, what's it going to do wrong? Which part of this is going to like utterly fail to stick the landing? I don't know. I do want to finish the, the trilogy because the first one is really, really solid. Really solid. So yeah, I enjoyed this. I'm just sad <laughs> that apparently I'm not going to enjoy the rest of it. The next book that I read was Fall of Hyperion by Dan Simmons. I read Hyperion the month before and I had started Fall of Hyperion in June. 
So I finished Fall Out Hyperion. And I didn't like it as much as Hyperion. Um, some of what I said about like where I was worried about where this was going, it kind of did go up there. <laughs> it's very, very spoilery and complicated. So I can't really, I can't really say even if I wanted to, it'd be a lot to explain. But basically we get sort of more complete answers for some of the mysteries that are set up in the first book. And the answers are sort of kind of where I was afraid they would go. But overall, I still really enjoyed it. And overall, I still think it's very, very impressive and definitely, you know, complex in interesting ways. It does some stuff that I find very irritating uh, beyond just the ending and the answers, um, especially as concerns the AI. There's an AI that's in the first book and in this book. And a lot to do with that AI in particular is very irritating to me. And it's in the stack, so I'll get to it. But there's another book that is far worse than this, um, but that irritated the piss out of me last month for similar reasons. This is a much, much better version of that, but still irritates me. <laughs> so I like it. I don't, dis I gave it four stars. Um, I gave Hyperion five. And I do intend to read the rest of the Hyperion books, but uh, definitely liked the first book better. Next up, I read, well, let's do them together. I reread Red Country and Sharp End. This is the first law read along that we're doing on the podcast, me and Bethany. Uh, that's, we did both of these together in July and the podcast episode for that is up on the, the podcast channel. I'll leave that link down below. We were joined by Ben from Overly Average Ben. And it was honestly such an amazing discussion. I really, really enjoyed that discussion, which was a pleasant surprise because Red Country is my least favorite first law book. I love Sharp Ends. And Red Country is good, don't get me wrong, but it's definitely not my favorite one. And I just, we had some, it was really amazing. Just like, it had a lot to unpack for us. And uh, in particular, because uh, we had quite different takes on it and quite different opinions about certain aspects of it. So there was a lot of food for discussion, more than I expected. Like we could have talked for like twice as long as we did. We cut ourselves off because we were trying to keep it to an hour. So anyway, I'll leave that link down below if you haven't seen it. And yeah, I mean this, uh, I, I upped my rating for Red Country before we had our conversation to four stars because I realized that 90, at least 90% of my favorite First Law quotes, like the quotes that I send to people when I'm trying to convince them to read First Law, quotes that I'm like, this is a great example of what Abercrombie can do. Here's a quote that should go on a mug. 90% of those quotes are in Red Country. And I was like, that's not nothing. So even though this is my least favorite story, uh, it's got some of the best words in all of First Law, in my opinion. But anyway, so yeah, I did enjoy the reread and I definitely, definitely enjoyed discussing it with Bethany and Ben. So check out our conversation if you would like. The next book I read, I don't have a physical copy of, but that was Morning Glory Milking Farm by Sam Ness Costa, I think. Who's the author? I have an entire vlog up of me reading it. And then there's the uh, the Blades and Bodice Rippers book club, which was the entire reason that I read it. Uh, we had our discussion on Mara's channel. So I pretty much said all I have to say about that book. I hated it. <laughs> I had all kinds of problems with it that I did not expect to have. If you're not familiar at all, you haven't seen that vlog, you don't know what this is. It is monster erotica about um, a millennial who gets a job at a milking farm where minotaurs are being milked and then a romance ensues. My problems with this book, I mean, I expected to have problems with this book, but my main problems with this book were not even to do with the erotic nature of it. So I hated it, but not what, not for the reasons that I thought I would. So anyway, uh, check out my vlog, check out our chat on Mara's channel or don't. Save yourself a couple of hours and just forget this book ever existed. Next is another book that I read with Mara, uh, and that is Fool's Fate by Robin Hobb. This is the third and final book in the Tawny Man trilogy. She and I are planning to have a chat on my channel to talk about Tawny Man now that we finished it and sort of like where we're at in our journey through the realm of the Elderlings. Sort of check in uh, and then hopefully, you know, we'll check in again after Rainwild and then check in when, we're, when we finish the realm of the Elderlings. So anyway, we finished Tawny Man. We did the thing. Uh, she and I have chatted about it just amongst ourselves. We have a lot of thoughts about how Tawny Man ended. A lot of thoughts. And she and I are pretty much in agreement um, on those thoughts, but a lot to unpack with sort of choices that were made with the series and with this book in particular. We both enjoyed it, but but not without asterisks. So I'm very much looking forward to having that chat. And I, I mean, I did enjoy Fool's Fate, but, but it uh, ended up giving it a four stars and not five because of because of my thoughts. <laughs> Next up, I read The Veiled Throne with my patrons by Ken Liu because we are reading along, read alonging, buddy reading the Dandelion Dynasty, me and my patrons. Um, and everyone told me that I would hate Veiled Throne, but just to like to accept it, that I will hate it and then look forward to Speaking Bones. And um, Veiled Throne is possibly my favorite book in the Dandelion Dynasty. So clearly no one knows me. I mean, I forgive you. It's understandable. I don't know me. 
I don't know what I'm going to like or even what I do like. But yeah, I was pleasantly surprised because I went into this going like, okay, apparently this is the one that I have to suffer through and just accept that before I get to what is good again in Speaking Bones. Um, but I loved the old throne. I really, really did. And the part of it, I mean, I was halfway through and I was like, I'm loving this. I don't know why all y'all said I was going to hate it. And then those who had already read it, they're like, no, no, no. We didn't think you'd hate the first half. You haven't gotten to the thing that we think you're going to hate. Just wait, you're going to hate it. And then I finished it and I was like, um, no, I loved it. Second half too. Possibly my favorite. So I remain an enigma to myself and to everyone else, but I, I really enjoyed it. I get why other people wouldn't, as much as I'm able to understand anyone's opinion other than my own. I don't really get why people thought that I would hate it though. Like I get why this, the second half of this book would be one of those like hit or miss kind of things where it's not like everyone's gonna love this, where you're like, the second half, Ugh. you might like it, you might not. But I don't know why everyone was like, oh, you in particular, Liana, you specifically, you will hate the second half of Veiled Throne. And I did. I loved it. Can't really tell you why because I'm not even because it's spoiler but because there's, this is the third book in a series. I'd have to explain so much to explain to you how we got to the point that we did and why people thought I would hate that and why I actually liked it. But anyway, looking forward to chatting about this with my patrons. Uh, we haven't had our chat about it yet, but we will soon. Next up is the book that I DNF'd and that was Keeper of Night by Kylie Lee Baker. This is my second time DNFing it. I got the audiobook from the library though, like a while ago. And uh, I started it and I was like, I'm not into this right now. And then like my hold on it lapsed. So I got it again from the library now because it's a book of the month club book and I like to check those off. I was like, okay, let's try that again. So I got a little further this time in the audiobook because I was determined to actually read it this time. And I was like, nope, I don't like this and I'm not going to like this. I already know that nothing's going to change that. I don't like it. <laughs> I'm not gonna like it. I don't want to film a review for it. I don't have that much to say about it. I just don't like it. I think it's pretty amateurish and clunky and I, I don't I don't want to read this. <laughs> so I DNF'd it like a boss. <laughs> Next up is another book of the month club book that I did actually finish. I started reading it physically when I first got it and then like accidentally DNF'd it. I just like put it down and I didn't finish it in that month and TBRs being TBRs it just then wasn't on my TBR the next month so I just I just never finished it but not like because I DNF'd it. So I got the audiobook from the library for this as well. Uh, and that is A Burning by Mega Majumdar. And this book I think is quite good, but I think it's too short. Like it's way too short because it's kind of, it's, it's a breakneck pace. Like this is paced the way that a film is paced. And a film could get away with this uh, short amount of, like this, such a short story with like, because the scenes kind of just like skip through, you know, you kind of like the important scenes and like nothing else and nothing in between which is what you have kind of have to do with a film. But a film is able to like really maximize each of those scenes by like using camera angles and, you know, actors acting and music and things like that to really get as much out of each of those scenes as possible. But here it was like the amount of scenes you get in a film, but without all of the impact that a film is able to sort of like suck out of every single scene. So this was a screenplay. I'd be like, this would be a great film, but it was just too short. And the points I was making just like couldn't marinate or give you the impact. Like I barely felt like I knew these characters because we were introduced to them and then the main events of the story like immediately start taking place. Like before you know them at all. Before you even, like I've barely figured out who is who before the events, before the sort of catalysts happen and massive life changes happen. It's just too fast. It's way too fast. And then not enough space in between to kind of like sit with the characters and see how this is affecting them. It was just, it's too short, it's too fast. So it didn't ha like, it didn't have the impact. It didn't punch me in the heart the way that it should have. Because what's happening, like it is pretty devastating. It is really fucking devastating. And I just, I wish it hadn't kind of like fast forwarded me, like whipped me through um, this pretty dark uh, and important story. Um, this is, uh, what is it? <laughs> it's, uh, I haven't said it all, if you don't know what it is. It's not fantasy, it is a uh, contemporary, lit pick, I guess. Uh, it takes place in India and it's to do with freedom of speech, about politics, about selfishness, about just, you know, sort of the shittiness of people. Yeah, it was, it was good, but too, too short, too fast. Uh, next up, I read these, uh, I got these from the library, so that's why one of them is still wrapped in plastic, um, but I'd gotten Bonecrier's Moon from Alcrate a long time ago and I was like, 
Uh, before I just toss it, but um, by toss it, I mean like sell it or donate it. Let's get the audiobook from the library and like actually see if it's any good. Cause it's a, it's a very, very pretty book and the Alcrate edition in particular has got gold pages and the like, it's like shimmery and stuff. And I was like, it's very pretty. So I was like, ah, get the audio from the library. See how it is before you just toss it. And I devoured it in one night. And immediately, and I was like, Does, is the second book available from the library? And there was no wait on it. So I immediately started listening to the second one and then finished that the next day. So like in less than 24 hours, I'd read both. And then uh, ordered, because I didn't have it, the Alcrate matching exclusive edition, which they released later. So I'd gotten this because I was a subscribed to their box at the time. I'm not anymore. Uh, so it had just come in my box, but like they separately released this. And I remember being like, I haven't read the first one. I have no idea if I like it. And I was like, I'm not ordering that and it's purple. <laughs> I still am upset that it's purple. It's not nearly as pretty as this one in my opinion, because it's purple. But uh, I wanted in a matching set because I really, really enjoyed this. I think the second one is not as good. It's not because it's purple. But the first one I really, really, really enjoyed a lot more than I thought. I thought about filming a separate standalone video for this, but then I was like, eh, eh. Like I really shouldn't like these books, uh, the first one in particular, because it has like everything that I hate. If you put, you know, like a bullet list, I'd be like, it has enemies to lovers, which I do not like. It has faded mate bond kind of, uh, romance, which I hate. It's got a chosen one. Tend not to like that. It's got a love triangle. Definitely don't like that. Yeah, so like I just, and the, I remember hearing what the premise was, like what the setup is, like what, what these characters, their situation is, and thinking that sounds contrived as hell and really stupid. And I still think it is contrived, but it works. And I really like the characters and I like, really like their dialogue. And it just worked for me. Like I absolutely devoured it. Like, I don't think it's great. Like, I don't think this is like, this is what YA could and should be. I'm just like, sometimes these tropes, sometimes they just work. And I haven't heard the very positive reviews for this or no, like I haven't heard anybody loathe or love this, which is another reason I was like, ah, well, I guess I'll read it before I give up on it. But I really enjoyed it. It's just like, it just hit right place, right time. I was in the mood and I just marathoned it. The second one, I didn't hate it. I just didn't think it was as good as the first one. But I, this was four stars. This was three stars. I had, I had a great time. It was fun reading these. So I guess I recommend if you're in the mood or something like that. But um, they're, they're not, they're not great. But I had a good time. So, you know, if you've already got it like I did, then try it. Next up I read Endless Night by Agatha Christie. I read this because um, I've seen several times the, um, the adaptation of it that was they did it as a Miss Marvel, even though Miss Marvel is not actually in Endless Night. I saw that when they first aired it, like when it first came out, and I've watched it a couple times since then. And I just recently rewatched it again because it had been a minute. And I was like, yeah, I'll watch that again. I was like, I'm pretty sure I remember what happens in it. It won't be like, I've forgotten. So it'll be like new. No, I, I was I was pretty sure I remember what happened. But after I finished watching it, this like fourth time or whatever, probably, I was like, I wonder, because I, I was like, I know I'm I'm also fairly certain Matt, that Miss Marvel is not in this story originally. They did a few like that where they like, they did a Marvel episode, but that's not actually a Marvel book. It is an Agatha Christie mystery, but it's, they've just like stuck Miss Marvel in to an existing mystery. So actually I read uh, The Secret of Chimneys last year, I think for the same reason, because I just recently rewatched The Secret of Chimneys and I was like, oh yeah, I should read this. I'm pretty sure Miss Marvel's not in it, even though she's in this. So anyway, I was like, yeah, I want to read Endless Night because Endless Night is really like the adaptation of it. I was like, this is very chilling. It's the darkest Marvel adaptation for sure. Uh, it's, I remember, Every time I've watched it, I've been like, this is, this is really dark. This is dark as fuck. How is this a Marvel? Marvel is cozy. This is not cozy. It got me wondering though. I was like, well, this isn't a Marvel story. So I was like, I wonder how much they changed. Like, I wonder if, if it even is this dark, like the original story. Like, I wonder how different it is. And I was like, you know what? I'll read it. So that's why I read Endless Night. And to my surprise, the adaptation with Miss Marvel in it is extremely loyal to the original story, which is crazy. Like you would think that's not possible because well, for one, they've stuck Miss Marple in it. Like, how loyal could it be? But it really is because, like, I remember, you know, it's pretty obvious. Like, when you watch it, you're like, if someone tells you, oh, yeah, this isn't originally a Marple story, you'd be like, yeah, I could have guessed that because she's hardly in it. Miss Marple is barely in that one. They basically just did an adaptation of Endless Night and then for the key scenes, invented a reason for Miss Marple to kind of, like, be around in the background or to, like, be passing by <laughs> when something happens. And then, like, to have her towards the end, like, show up and, like, do the explaining of what happened in this mystery. But she's barely in it. Um, so the adaptation with Ms. Marvel is actually like an extremely faithful adaptation. And it does make one really important change. And I like that change a lot. And it's not, I mean, obviously they put Ms. Marvel in it, that's a change. <laughs> but that's not what I'm talking about. They did a, something else where like, it's basically, they took two things that already are in Endless Night. They both already exist in Endless Night. 
And the, in the adaptation, they connected them. They like uh, added in something that would connect those two things. I'm being vague because in case I don't want to spoil anything if you haven't seen it or read it. And I really like that choice. I like that they took what was already there and they were like, you know how much more I would add to this story if we connected those two things that are already there. Um, so great idea. Um, I really like the adaptation. I really like the book. I would probably have liked the book slightly more if I hadn't seen the adaptation. Not just because I liked the choice and was sad it wasn't actually in the book, but also because I already knew the ending. I already knew the mystery. I already knew the answer to the riddle. Um, so I wonder how I would have felt if I didn't know, but I remember watching the adaptation and being shocked the first time. So I probably would have felt similarly reading this the first time if I had not ever seen an adaptation before. So anyway, very good, very short, very dark, and the adaptation is good. Next up is the book that my patrons chose for me to read and vlog for them, and I sure did. I gave them an hour and a half long vlog of me ranting about The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet by Becky Chambers. I expected to not love this. I expected this to be a book that I would feel meh about, that I would disappoint people because I would be like, I don't get the appeal. I didn't care for it. It's not my cup of tea. And I expected it to be, you know, a 20 minute vlog in which I'm like, you know, I just, it's not for me. Um, but instead, I chopped down like three hours of footage into an hour and a half of ranting about this book because I hated this book so much. This isn't a situation where I'm like, it's just, I don't get it. It's kind of boring. Whatever. No. Fucking hate this book. I despise it. In the vlog, I was like, I know Norwegian wood is worse. Right now, this feels worse. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, Norwegian wood came to mind because this isn't just a book where I'm like, I don't get it. I really don't understand why people like this. No, I'm like genuinely kind of upset to learn that people like this and like it a lot. And it's really, really popular. And like the people that do like it, I'm like, I, I'm sorry, but I think less of you now. I can't help it, I'm sorry. And that's many people, this is really, really popular. But this was, a, this book deeply upset me. I was, I was livid. So yeah, that's a one star. Um, and a no from me. <laughs> the next book that I read was Pillars of Creation by Terry Goodkind for the Sword of Truth read along. The live show for this was on Bethany's channel. And I really, really enjoyed this the second time. I remembered liking it the first time, like not loving it, like it wasn't an all time fave or anything. But I remember it, I was like, I think I remember enjoying that one. And I did really enjoy it the second time. There's, I think it's too long. There are some things about it that I would be fine with not having in there, or at least less of. But I really enjoyed it. And I really had a good time talking about it with Bethany on her channel. So if you missed it, you know, the replay is available to you. I'll leave a link down below. But yeah, I'm, I'm not really looking forward to Naked Empire, the next one. I remember, I remember that one not doing it for me so much so that I stopped reading the books. Not because I hated it, but I just... You know, anyway, so this is the last one that I remember quite enjoying and I did enjoy it. Uh, I was glad I enjoyed it the second time, actually more than the one that had been my former favorite. Um, that one I didn't enjoy as much and this one I enjoyed more. So um, yeah, that's Pillars of Creation. Next up, I read Crooked House by Agatha Christie. Uh, the reason that I read this, I mean, I, in general, I was interested in reading it, but um, the audiobook that I got of Endless Night from the Library, for some reason, was an audiobook that was like combined uh, both Endless Night and Crooked House. And because I wanted to get Endless Night, I was like, okay, well, I'll get this one. And I finished Endless Night. And then I had other stuff that I needed to read, like Pillars of Creation for the live. Um, so I didn't have time to go on and read Crooked House. But I was like, I've still got it. Um, I was like, let's read Crooked House too. Um, and I have seen the movie Crooked House, the newest one, the one with Glenn Close. And so I was like, I wonder how loyal that is as an adaptation. And I am happy to report that the adaptation of it is extremely loyal. Uh, obviously they make, they take some liberties and make some changes and make some scenes in it more cinematic and dramatic. And some of the relationships between people have more tension and more drama. And the climax of the film is much more sort of like big and like an action set piece more. Not an, yeah, an action set, it is an action set piece. But anyway, um, other than that though, like the story is the same pretty much. Um, the twists are pretty much the same. The answer is the same. It's just, you know, made more dramatic in Hollywood in the film. And it's a good film in my opinion. So I really enjoyed reading the book. It's a good mystery. I really, really enjoyed, like, it's again, one of those, I should, I should read a Christie where I don't know the end. Because like, I remember when I watched Crooked House the first time, I've seen it a couple times. The first time I watched it, I was like, what? That I was, I did not see that coming as like the twist or the, the answer to the mystery. So I'm, I'm guessing I probably would have felt that way reading this the first time. 
but I already knew. So mostly I was like, I wonder if it's the same or if they changed it. And if they did change it, how much they changed. And they didn't change it. So I was like, okay, so it's like the, like the movie. So that means like I couldn't be surprised because I already knew, but I was happy to learn that the film had been accurate. So anyway, I did enjoy it. And I think I would have loved it if I didn't know the twist. <laughs> and the last book that I read in July, at long, long last, finally finished Jade War by Honda Lee. This is the second book in the Greenbone Saga. I'm intending to read Jade Legacy in August for realties. It took me for, I started Jade War, I read like the first half of it a couple months ago. And then just, you know, had other books that were obligations for this and the other that kept getting in the way of me finishing Jade War. Because Jade War wasn't as anything that I had like a live or a buddy read or anything like that for. So I finally finished it because I had finished all my obligation books for July and I was like, I'm reading Jade War. <laughs> And it's so good, it's so good, it's so good. I'm gonna film a review for it soon. So good, oh my God. It, ugh. people say legacy is better, like how? I mean, this is so good, five stars. Love it, love it, love it. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a, it's a second book. So when I film a review, I will probably do, you know, non-spoiler and spoiler because it's hard to talk about with no spoilers because most of what happens, it's a second book. So even the starting point is kind of spoilery. So anyway, um, Non-spoiler, I love it, five stars, it's amazing. Can't wait to be horrified by reading <laughs> Jade Legacy. <laughs> Promises to be brutal. And those are all the books that I read in July. Let me know your thoughts and feelings about my thoughts and feelings. Whatever you wanna let me know. I post videos on Saturdays, other random times as well, but definitely Saturdays, so like and subscribe. Join my Patreon if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you when I see you. Bye.